Damocles liked the good life. At least that's what we're told. Not that he had any wealth of his own, but he liked being around people who did. He hung around the court of King Dionysus II of Sicily. Damocles would taunt the king and say, what a cushy job he had, surrounded with luxuries. So one day the king suggested Damocles spend a day on his throne. Of course, he jumped at the offer. But Dionysus had a lesson he wanted to teach the young man. After he got comfortable sitting on the throne, the king pointed up above his head where he saw a large sword hanging there with its point aimed directly at him. All that prevented the sword from falling down and slicing him in two was a single hair of a horse's tail. Damocles learned that day that a king's life was a perilous one. With swords, both literally and figuratively, pointed at them all of the time. This story, known as the Sword of Damocles, dates to the 4th century BC. Around 6 centuries earlier, God informed King David that a sword would be pointed at his family, threatening them through the generations. It didn't have to be that way, though. David had once been God's golden child, so to speak. Faithful to God in all ways, and God had richly rewarded him. But as you recall from last Sunday, the mighty had fallen, and fallen hard. He coveted the wife of one of his own soldiers, slept with her, getting her pregnant, and then he plotted her husband's murder after other attempts failed to cover up his own role in the pregnancy. As we'll find out today, Uriah the Hittite is slain in battle as planned. His wife, Bathsheba, mourned, but then was brought to the palace to be David's latest wife. The child was born, and for a while, it seemed like nobody else knew what happened, but God knew. Today in our service, we'll be talking about, I almost got away with it. Stick around for details. Grace and peace to you from our Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome to the online worship service of Robinson Memorial Presbyterian Church in Gastonia, North Carolina, for Sunday, August 1st, 2021. It's a busy day for us. Later on, we'll be celebrating the Sacrament of Communion. If you haven't already done so, we invite you to pause this service now and prepare the elements of bread and drink that you can use later on in the service. The Eucharist, as it is sometimes referred to, is one of two sacraments in the church that we observe, the other being baptism. In communion, we share a meal with Christ and each other, remembering Him and anticipating His return in glory. Also today, being the first Sunday of the month, we'll be dedicating your five cents a meal offering to help battle hunger issues both near and far. We also want to remind you of our school supplies challenge going on now through August 15th, two Sundays from now. The supplies we are collecting for Robinson Elementary School are next door neighbors. Pencils, facial tissues, crayons, colored pencil, folders, loose-leaf paper, and 
composition notebooks, glue sticks, safety scissors, eraser caps to put on the ends of pencils, earbuds. The big blue box is on the ramp to the office wing door, just waiting for you to fill it up, or at least partially fill it up. We are, as you can see, doing good so far, but I don't put it past our competitors to try something this year to avenge their embarrassing loss last year. Yet in the end, remember, all that the four churches collect goes for a good cause, helping and serving our neighbors. Now, let's begin today's service with our responsive call to worship. You'll find the words on your screen. I beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God who is above all and through all and in all. Each of us was given grace according to the measure of Christ's gift. Speaking the truth in love, we must grow up in every way into him who is the head. Let us worship God. With us celebrating communion today, bread is naturally on our minds. Bread comes up frequently throughout the Bible in many contexts. Our opening hymn today is Break Thou the Bread of Life. Please join in singing with us.
In Psalm 91, we read this promise from God. Those who love me, I will deliver. I will protect those who know my name. When they call to me, I will answer them. I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue and honor them. With long life, I will satisfy them and show them my salvation. With that in mind, let us confess our sins and seek forgiveness. God of mercy, be above us to judge us and be within us to convict us of our sin. Teach us who worship false gods to fear you, the one true God. Teach us who commit evil deeds to obey you and you alone. Teach us who oppress our neighbors the ways of righteousness and truth. Teach us who do not pursue peace, the futility of war, and the blessing of shalom. And all God's people said, Amen. God was in Christ, reconciling the world, satisfying our hunger and thirst after righteousness. Jesus is the bread of life. All who come to him and humbly confess their sin will be filled with God's mercy and sustained by God's grace. So, taste and see how God cares for you. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. As we mentioned earlier, this week we collect our monthly contributions to the Five Cents a Meal offering. Half of our contributions go to help support the programs at Crisis Assistance Ministry of Greater Gastonia. The other half we submit to the Presbytery of Western North Carolina for distribution by its Hunger Committee to programs throughout the region and beyond. And we also give thanks for your continued support of the mission and ministry of Robinson Memorial. Your help keeps this ministry going. Now, let us dedicate your gifts, tithes, and offerings to the service of the Lord. Let's pray. O oh God, in Christ you call us to lead a life worthy of our calling. We come before you and implore you to accept our gifts. We offer our diversity, that it may be made one by your reconciling spirit. We return to you the talents conferred by your creative goodness. We present to you our acts of obedience in response to your trust. May who we are and what we do be acceptable in your sight through Christ our Redeemer. Amen.
Our Old Testament reading today comes to us from 2 Samuel, chapter 11, verse 26, through chapter 12, verse 15. Listen now for the word of our Lord. When the wife of Uriah heard that her husband was dead, she made lamentation for him. When the morning was over, David sent and brought her to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord, and the Lord sent Nathan to David. He came to him and said to him, There were two men living in a certain city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had very many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb, which he had bought. He brought it up, and it grew up with him and with his children. It used to eat of his meager fare and drink from his cup and lie in his bosom. And... It was like a daughter to him. Now, there came a traveler to the rich man, and he was loath to take one of his own flock or herd to prepare for the wayfarer who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared that for the guest who had come to him. Then David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. He said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die. He shall restore the lamb fourfold, because he did this thing, and because he had no pity. Nathan said to David, You are the man. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel, and I rescued you from the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your bosom, and gave you the house of Israel and of Judah. And if that had been too little, I would have added as much more. Why have you despised the word of the Lord to do what is evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and have taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house, for you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, I will raise up trouble against you from within your own house, and I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor, and he shall lie with your wives in the sight of this very son. For you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the sun. David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan said to David, Now the Lord has put away your sin. You shall not die. Nevertheless, Because by this deed you have utterly scorned the Lord, the child that is born to you shall die. Then Nathan went to his house. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. For eight seasons, the cable network Investigations Discovery, or ID for short, 
produced a program by the name of I Almost Got Away With It. It featured actors reenacting other people who had committed crimes, sometimes heinous crimes, but either eluded law enforcement at first or escaped from captivity. Confession time. I've never seen the show, but I love the title. I almost got away with it. Last Sunday, we ended our sermon on a cliffhanger. King David had impregnated Bathsheba, wife of Uriah the Hittite. He failed at efforts to get Uriah to sleep with his wife in order to mask his fatherhood. So, he sent Uriah back to the battlefield with secret orders that he be put in the front lines where the fighting would be the worst. Between that reading from 2 Samuel and today's reading, the orders were carried out. Uriah was directed to the strongest defensive position for the city of Rabbah, where he and other Israelite soldiers were slain. David received the news, and uncharacteristically for him, the king was calm about it. A lot of times when somebody brought him bad news, it didn't turn out too well for the messenger. But here, he's more like, well, these things happen. Despite all the men killed in the attack, David was okay with it because it got him out of a lot of hot water. Uriah was dead. Bathsheba observes a proper mourning period for her late husband, but then is taken to the king's palace where she marries David. The child is born to Bathsheba, and no one seems to be the wiser, even if, you know, born sooner than what might have been expected if conceived after their wedding. Or if people noticed, they kept it to themselves. After all the weeks and months of the pregnancy that go by, David has to be thinking, I got away with it. No one cared. Life goes on. But God knew and cared. This paragon of virtue and fealty to God had in effect spurned the Almighty turned his back on the Lord. God commands the prophet Nathan to deliver a message. And no, it wasn't a congratulations message on the new wife and child. Before, Nathan had delivered good news to the king. This time, it would be bad. And we already mentioned how David reacted badly to bad news. We think of Jesus when the word parable comes up, but Jesus didn't invent this way of embedding important messages into stories. Nathan decides a parable would be the best way to convey this bad news from God. It's a perfect trap. A rich man who owned large herds takes the one lamb owned by a poor man, a lamb treasured by his family. The rich man stole the lamb and served it up so he could impress a traveler, then taking the credit for being a fine host. Sort of how David might have seemed so gracious for taking the widowed Bathsheba as his wife? The man in Nathan's story committed a crime and reaped the benefits of that crime. 
hearing this story. David is infuriated. The rich man deserves to die, the king declares, plus must pay the poor man four times the value of the lamb. How dare he? Did he just think he'd get away with it because he was rich and powerful? Nathan's trap snapped firmly on David. You are the man in the story. God is talking about you. Did you really think he didn't know what you had done? Did you think he approved of it or didn't care? You were the one most loyal to God, and God rewarded you, gave you power and riches of your own, and would have given you more. Nowadays, we tend to attribute the line, with great power comes great responsibility, to the superhero Spider-Man. But the phrase was used long before that at least as far back as the Sword of Damocles story. David bore a higher level of accountability than anyone else in his kingdom because he had been so blessed by God. In our passage today, we are reminded that everyone, everyone, including kings, are subject to God's judgment. Even those of us who proclaim Christ as our ruler and savior will face God's judgment in the end. You might think you'll get away with something, but that word almost drags us back into reality. I almost got away with it. No, no you didn't. By the conclusion of each episode of that TV series, the alleged criminal is caught and pays the penalty. King David was caught in a public forum. All of Israel now knows what happened. And to his credit, David confesses, I have sinned. For some reason, he had forgotten that God's justice would prevail. But now he remembered. God's mercy also prevails, in part, for David. God won't remove David from the throne like he did with King Saul. He gets to keep his power and his possessions. But someone has to pay for his misdeeds. Regretfully, it is the newborn child. It pays the price for the deaths of Uriah and the other soldiers who died in battle with him. It was a punishment for David as well, having to see his son languish for seven days before dying. And while David's reign is secured by God, generations of his descendants would suffer due to David's misbehavior. Interesting that this story made it into our Bible. Despite 1st and 2nd Samuel both being decidedly pro-David on so many levels, the writer did not omit this incident from the records. The truth was ugly, but it was the truth. Remember, though, the Bible is God's story, not David's. So the whole world would know of David's sin. God had mercy, but David still paid for his sins. David would die around 970 B.C. The kingdom he built would later divide into two and both of those kingdoms would be destroyed. But 
Fortunately for us, God's promise to David was never forgotten. It led us to Christ, who, with mercy, serves as our intercessor now. So, even if we believe we almost got away with something, just remember, God knows, yet judges with mercy. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. As we prepare ourselves for communion, join in singing the hymn, Let Us Break Bread Together. Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If those who hear my voice open the door, I will come in to them and eat with them, and they with me. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Happy are all who find refuge in God. Friends, this is the joyful feast of the people of God. They will come from east and west and from north and south and sit at the table in the kingdom of God. According to Luke, when our risen Lord was at table with his disciples, he took the bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him. This table here is not the exclusive property of Robinson Memorial or the Presbyterian Church or any church for that matter. This is the Lord's table. Our Savior invites those who trust Him to share the feast which He has prepared. Let us turn our hearts and minds to the Lord, giving our thanks to God through prayer, beginning with the responsive reading that will be on your screen. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Holy God, 
Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. With joy, we praise you and give thanks to your name. You commanded light to shine out of darkness, divided the sea and dry land, created the vast universe and called it good. You made us in your image to live with one another in love. You gave us the breath of life and freedom to choose your way. You promised yourself in covenant with Abraham and Sarah, told us of your purpose in commandments through Moses, and called for justice in the cry of prophets. Through long generations, you have been faithful and kind to all your children. We praise you, most holy God, for sending your only Son to live among us, sharing our joy and sorrow. He told your story, healed the sick, and was a friend of sinners. Obeying you, he took up his cross and died that we might live. We praise you that he overcame death and has risen to rule the world. He is still the friend of sinners. We trust him to overcome every power that can hurt or divide us and believe that when he comes in glory, we will celebrate victory with him, remembering all of your mighty and merciful acts. We break bread and share one cup, giving thanks for your saving love in Jesus Christ. As you raised our Lord from death and call us with him from death to life, we give ourselves to you to live for him in joy and grateful praise. On this day, we call on your care, comfort, and healing for those who are on our minds. Our prayers today for Sandra Featherstone, for Betty Helms, for Joe, for the Donnie Huffstetler family. We pray for Leslie and Michaela, for Paul and Jean, for Alan, Victoria, Victor, and Patrick, for Dallas. Our continuing prayers for Claudette and Joyce, for Marilyn and Lee and Susan and Ben, for Barbara Plyler, for Jerry and Buster, for Leanne and Johnny, for Larry, Stephen, David and Beverly, for Adrian and for Rick. Our prayers for Pat Bunton and Chris, Gary, Ellen, Nancy, Ashley, Mary, for Mitchell and Barbara, for Kennedy and Vinny, for John and Helen, and for Lorraine Miller. Gracious God, pour out, your, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these, your gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. Send us out into the power of the Spirit to live for others as Christ lived for us, announcing his death for the sins of the world and telling his resurrection to all people and nations. By your Spirit, draw us together into one body and join us to Christ the Lord that we may remain his glad and faithful people until we feast with him in glory. Through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, 
All glory and honor are yours, almighty God, forever and ever. And now we pray together the words you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The Lord Jesus, on the night of his arrest, took bread. And after giving thanks to God, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup. saying, this cup is the new covenant, sealed in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the saving death of the risen Lord until he comes. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. The body of Christ given for you. the blood of Christ shed for you. Let us pray. Loving God, we thank you that you have fed us in this sacrament, united us with Christ, and given us a foretaste of the heavenly banquet in your eternal kingdom. Send us out in the power of your spirit to live and work to your praise and glory for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now, Christians, let us say together what it is we believe by reciting the words of the Nicene Creed. Those words will appear on your screen. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is, seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, 
who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. We end today's service with the hymn, Blessed Be the Tie That Binds. Sing along as Ashley provides the music. Thank you for joining us today for worship here at Robinson Memorial Presbyterian. If you liked this service, please give it a like. And most importantly, share it with others. Don't forget that the big blue box is out, ready to take your donations of school supplies for Robinson Elementary. And as for your gifts, tithes, and offerings to this church, our mailing address, along with a QR code to scan, will be on your screen in a moment. Stay safe out there and encourage others to get vaccinated against COVID-19 if they haven't already. Remember, love our neighbors. Remember, Christ was faithful over God's house as a son, and we are His house if we hold firm to the confidence and the pride that belong to hope. And now, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May He make His face to shine upon you and give you His peace, now and forevermore. Amen. <music>